In last week's video, I talked about the Mach 1 special audio system and how to set it up in Cubase and or Nuendo. And in this video, I would like to follow up by giving a little bit of more detail on what the advantages are and what the disadvantages are and why you should go with one spatial audio format as opposed to another. So if you are in the uh, spatial audio arena or you want to get familiar with spatial audio and you have not yet figured out which format you should use, should it be uh, Ambisonics, should it be Dolby Atmos or maybe Mach 1, this is the video for you. So stick around. But first of all, hello everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I teach at the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design, and spatial audio. And if any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join my Discord community. An invite link is in the description below. And as always, please don't forget to press the like button because once again, YouTube wants us to do that. Now in this video, I'm going to say a couple of nice things about Mach 1. So I should probably clarify that this is not a sponsored video. I'm not taking sponsorships from anybody and Mach 1 is not an exception. In fact, when I first heard about Mach 1, I was highly skeptical because I felt it is too simplistic for what we need it for. But as it turns out, it's actually a nice thing. So uh, all the opinions here are strictly my own. And with that being said, let's go into the details of Mach 1. Now, the way I'm going to start today is by making a comparison between the different audio formats, in particular Mach 1, Ambisonics, and Dolby Atmos. And what I've done is I've simply taken the project that I did last week and I added some Ambisonics and some Dolby Atmos processing so that we can compare between the different spatial audio approaches. So let's first have a look on uh, what we're actually working with. And for that, I have a simple instance of uh, Viper and I'm just going to use the standard preset with Viper. And uh, what I've done is I've essentially taken the stereo image of Viper and I folded it down into mono. Now in Cubase, you need to do that with a, or the appropriate way to do that is with a mono group track. So I'm routed the uh, Viper channel into a mono group track and then essentially panned that mono group track. And I tried to pan it in such a way that it is about 45 degrees to the left. Uh, so let's have a brief li listen on how that sounds. So it's essentially just a, the, the standard preset of Viper panned to the left. Now I've now tried to do the same things with the Mach 1 system, with the Ambisonics and with Dolby Atmos. And in doing so, I tried to level match. So, so I'm, I, what you are going to hear is more or less uh, the same gain. I tried to do the best that I can. And I've also tried to uh, position it in the same space, which uh, for the other audio formats was always uh, 45 degrees. In case of Dolby Atmos, I actually had to move the object a little bit further away, and that has to do with the way essentially the decoder works. Now, before anybody gets too excited, uh, obviously, um, if we are talking about spatial audio, we can do, do more than just panning left and right. The reason I'm sticking with a simple left-right pan here is because most of you are going to listen to this on a stereo system, most likely not even with headphones. And that essentially means that anything that is uh, in three-dimensional space would be completely lost on you uh, because the quality of the reproduction of the three-dimensional image would be um, would depend much on the actual decoder that we are using. Uh, so in order to make sure that we have a fair comparison, I'm going to stick to left, right. But, uh, you know, kind of what I'm doing here is very simple to do. So if you want to replicate that and kind of play around with it, just open up Cubase or Nuendo and kind of put these things in. And if you don't have a license for Mach 1, you can actually use a trial. There is a trial license uh, they have. Uh, uh, and, and then essentially play around with it and see what works. Now, so let's let's look at the different uh, approaches that we have. The first one here was the Mach 1. And what we did with Mach 1, let me just open that up here. We took the uh, instrument channel, we routed that once again in order to fold it down into a mono channel, into a mono bus. And then we took the mono bus and uh, routed that into a 7.1 track. The reason we needed 7.1 is because Mach 1 requires 8 channels and uh, we needed an 8 channel track. As I said last week, um, we are not really using the 7.1 as a 7.1. We are just using it to hold a generic 8 channel track. So uh, all we, what we needed to do is disable all the panning functions. In the uh, M1 panner track, group track, we have the M1 panner. And as you can see here, I have essentially panned it to the uh, 45 degrees to the to the left. And then the uh, the panner track is routed into a bus. Now, the way this obviously would work that if you have multiple 
tracks that you're working with, you would all route them into the same uh, M1 bus. And in the M1 bus, we then have the monitoring plugin. And uh, the monitoring plugin, oops, we have the panel here, the monitoring plugin is essentially the M1 monitor. And I just used the standard settings, uh, Mach 1 special. That's essentially everything that I did. I'm not doing any head tracking here. That, that's all that I really did. So let's have a listen to how that sounds. And by comparison, the original one without any spatial panning. So it's essentially uh, pretty much the same. Now, uh, moving on to Ambisonics. Uh, in Ambisonics, what we would do is we would simply take the um, instrument and we would route that into an Ambisonics bus. And Cubis would actually do all the conversion itself. So as soon as you do that, what you're getting is you're getting an Ambisonics panner and the Ambisonics panner would then essentially um, route it into the into the Ambisonics bus. And on the Ambisonics bus, you then have an Ambisonics monitor and Ambisonics decoder. So let's just have a brief look at the uh, at the panner here. Um, this is the Ambisonics panner. Uh, because I also have a Dolby Atmos uh, on there, it kind of tells me that's in bad mode. For, don't, don't worry too much about that. It. It's essentially just the Ambisonics panner. And uh, I once again have moved the uh, object or the, the sound source 45 degrees to the left. And that's pretty much everything that I did there. And on the Ambisonics bus, there's one thing that we need to do. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't have headphones selected because if you have headphones selected, what it is doing, it, it is adding additional processing in order to give you a full spatialization that you would normally hear with headphones in order to make a fair comparison. I selected speakers. So that is essentially just folding down the ambisonic signal back to a stereo signal. And let's have a listen to how that sounds there. And by comparison, we have the Mach 1 and the standard panel. So as we can see, the, uh, these three are actually almost identical. So you can actually use them, obviously, in, in exactly the same way. Obviously, if you go into three-dimensional space, the differences start to appear uh, when you're starting to move uh, sound around in three-dimensional space. So the fact that I have them uh, set up here in a way that the sound signature is completely identical across the different approaches does not mean that it is, would be completely identical if you do it on a greater scale with multiple tracks and panning those around. So just be aware of that. Uh, and then finally, we have the Atmos approach. And in the Atmos approach, what we essentially have is we have a 7.1.4 bus. And this 7.1.4 bus, oops, this 7.1.4 bus essentially holds the Dolby Atmos renderer. And uh, um, in, in this particular example, all I really did is I took the, um, the, 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 the Viper and I moved that into an object. So I needed to set up the ADM, um, the ADM authoring for Dolby Atmos. So essentially kind of set up, uh, first of all, select the, the renderer and then essentially just add one object. And the object that I'm adding is the uh, Viper instance that I have here. Now, in order to make that sound identical, what I had to do is I had to move the object further away. In an object mode, obviously, there's a slight difference. That has to do with the way um, Dolby Atmos uh, essentially converts everything back to stereo. I wouldn't read too much into it. It's just, it's just kind of that I had to kind of change the distance slightly. And uh, if I do that, essentially, I have the I have the same effect. So let's just see what, what's happening here. So if I'm just playing the Atmos version. So this is the Atmos version. This is the Ambisonics version. That's the Mach 1 version. And if we do it without any special panning. Now, so, so they, are, they are reasonably similar. Uh, if you have really well-trained ears, you might hear a slight difference in the Ambisonics approach that has to do with the way essentially Ambisonics is calculated or Ambisonics really works. But in essence, the overall sound signature is identical. I should probably also clarify that in case of the Ambisonics and the Atmos approaches, I didn't really need to convert the, uh, the stereo signal into a mono signal first. And the reason for that is because the panner allows me to do that within the panner. So I didn't, I didn't really need to do that. With Mach 1, the difference is, is that you choose different panners depending on whether you have a mono signal or a stereo signal. And in order to make sure that I could use the mono signal, I, uh, I essentially had to convert it to mono first. So let's talk briefly about Dolby Atmos. Now, I did a lot of videos about Dolby Atmos. I'm once again going to stay on the absolute surface, just giving you the, uh, the basic concept. Dolby Atmos is a 
file format or is a format that allows you to store spatial audio in an object-based way. And that essentially means that instead of storing the channels or kind of mushing everything together in a channel-based audio, what you really have is you have the individual sound objects and you're storing the sound objects along with the path or the, the, the position of that sound object in the file itself. And the actual panning or the rendering is done at the consumer device, at the endpoint device. And that has the main advantage that uh, you can optimize your experience to the particular speaker layout that you have. So if you have a Dolby Atmos system that has a 7.1.4 speaker layout, the Dolby Atmos system can do the panning in such a way that it optimizes the um, audio quality on that particular system. And if you have one that is a 5.1, uh, it can do the same. So um, there is a lot of possibilities in terms of optimization at the consumer device. Now in this video I decided to go a little bit into the mathematical details, but I'm going to stay or going to keep it as simple as humanly possible. So if you are somebody who essentially is terrified by mathematics, don't worry. I try to keep everything as simple as possible, but I think it makes sense to just look into what the what the specifics are of the Mach 1 audio format. And the best way to really do that is to go to the developer side of the Mach 1 developers, really. They have a GitHub page where you can get some of the tools that they use. There's a couple of things that you can actually get uh, in, in an open source format, and they invite you to actually participate in the, in the development process. So let's have a look at that particular page, and I'm going to post links to the web pages that I'm going to use in this video in the description below so if you want to check them out you can uh, you can just follow those links and kind of go dig into as deeply as you want to so let's have a look so let's first go down the web page a little and uh, if we go down here we essentially get to the point that uh, tries to explain what exactly uh, Mach 1 is and uh, it says essentially Mach 1 is based on what they call a virtual vector based panning approach and this virtual vector based panning approach is a controlled virtual version in, that's in their own words of a traditional vector based amplitude panning approach or a special PCM sampling approach. Now these are very fancy terms uh, but describe concepts that are actually very very easy to understand. So let's first talk briefly about vector based amplitude panning. Now the idea of vector based ampli based vector based amplitude panning is actually extremely simple and it's something that everybody here feels comfortable with. If you want a sound for if you're working in a stereo environment for example and you want the sound to come uh, to to be positioned slightly on the left what you would do is you would have the amplitude or the gain on the left speaker higher than on the right speaker. And you can extend that to three dimensions. If you have multiple speakers, not only two, but three speakers, you can do the same thing by just playing around with the, with the different amplitudes of those three different speakers. You would then position a sound in three-dimensional space. And mathematically speaking, the way you do that is through vector algebra. So you're kind of trying to um, represent the vector that points to the sound source by the vectors that point to the individual speakers and the coefficients that you have in that linear combination then essentially gives you the different amplitudes for those speakers. The thing is, which is more interesting is the spatial PCM sam sampling approach. And that's actually one thing that uh, establishes the um, relationship to the ambisonics approach. And in order to get a sense of what that actually is, it makes sense to go to the actual source of the person who came up with that idea. And that is somebody that most of people here in the spatial audio community are well aware of, that's Angelo Farina, and uh, on his webpage he actually kind of explains on what that is, what spatial PCM sampling is, and how Mach 1 actually fits into that concept. So let's look into his webpage. So on his webpage, and once again, link in the description be below, he talks about the SPS format. So this was the spatial PCM sampling format and uh, how it relates to Mach 1. And uh, the basic idea is actually fairly straightforward. Now, if you remember the way we talked about, and I'm just going to scroll down here, that we talked about ambisonics. We talked about ambisonics as a way that can be seen as a generalization of the mid-side processing paradigm. But we can also look at it from a slightly more mathematical perspective. And the way this is usually done with the help of so-called virtual microphones. These individual ambisonics channels correspond to, as it turns out, correspond to the signal that you would get if you would have microphones with very specific uh, pickup patterns. And these pickup patterns are usually these little balloons that uh, kind of you see when you're talking about uh, um, ambisonics. So for example, here, uh, this one here uh, would, would be a pickup pattern that, uh, that corresponds to the first or actually the second channel in the ambisonic signal. Now these uh, microphones are called virtual 
show microphones simply because they physically do not exist. Uh, the green balloons are actually negative pickup patterns. You actually have an inversion there, and you can't you can't physically build that. So so that's just a mathematical construct um, that you use in order to kind of get to the ambisonics format. But it, it's actually not really a microphone that you can build. Now, why would you do it that way? That sounds awfully complicated, right? Um, and uh, the reason for that is because the mathematics requires you to do that. So what you're really doing in ambisonics from a mathematical perspective is that you are taking the sound field, which is a kind of is a representation of the sound pressure around you, and you're trying to represent that in the mathematically cleanest way possible, and that's the way essentially you do that. You end up with this so-called spherical harmonics, which essentially in, in turn correspond to this virtual pickup patterns and virtual microphones. Now, the advantage of doing it that way is that it has some properties that are very unique and that really are very uh, useful in some applications. So, for example, a rotation in the sound field uh, can be represented by a rotation in the field of ambisonics. So, uh, so essentially what you need to do if you want to rotate your sound field is essentially just calculate the corresponding rotation matrix in the space of uh, spherical harmonics and then essentially do the rotation there. Now, once again, if you have no clue what I'm talking about, uh, what you need to know about that is simply that uh, rotations are very simple to do. So it's it's that that's really all there is to it. It's very simple to rotate things and that has really, really important consequences for applications such as uh, game design or virtual reality where you're constantly rotating your sound field because you're moving in your three-dimensional space. So so that that is sort of the way ambisonics was originally defined. Now the problem uh, comes from the fact that first of all ambisonics is really difficult to understand. Most people don't really have a clear understanding of what it means and if you want to really dig into everything in in, in great detail, you really need to have an understanding of some advanced mathematics that's really necessary. Uh, and once again, the second thing is because you're converting that into the space of spherical harmonics, you cannot really use standard effects uh, in, in this particular setup. So you can't really use your standard effects uh, for an ambisonic signal. You need to have specialized tools that can deal with this type of functions. Now, what you're doing in spatial PCM sampling is simply replacing those virtual microphones with microphones that have a physically possible pickup pattern. So instead of using these virtual microphones with these unrealistic pickup patterns, what you're doing is you're taking microphones that have very specific uh, patterns, but still are physically possible. And that essentially means that whatever you capture through those microphones can be processed just in, uh, in a very regular way. So you don't need any specialized tools in doing that. You can simply use your regular your regular um, tools, you can use your regular kind of uh, effects and everything, and they just work. Um, now, the Mach 1 spatial audio system is really just a special case of the spatial PCM sampling method, as it was co-invented by Angelo Farina. And uh, it does use a very specific amplitude panning algorithm. So that is not the standard vector-based amplitude panning algorithm. So if you look at it closer, you actually see that. So there's some additional innovation there, but it, it's sort of a special case of that particular approach and therefore shares many of the advantages with ambisonics, but at the same time can be used in the very same way as a traditional audio format. So it, it really is a combination of both worlds. Now, there are some advantages that ambisonics has that um, the Mach 1 system does not have. For example, this easy way of rotating things, you can't really do that in, uh, in uh, Mach 1. However, um, for most people, that's probably not going to matter that much. So uh, the, the idea to have an, an audio format that's actually very easy to use on the production end of sound or the production end of music is probably more appealing than uh, to have an audio format that is particularly useful when you implement that in a virtual environment or in a game design um, project, right? So, so it's, it's uh, the, the fact that you're kind of emphasizing the production part is, is, is probably for the better for most of us. So this is really everything I wanted to say today. I hope this was not too technical. I tried to stay as simple as humanly possible. And uh, I might have oversimplified a couple of things. If that is the case, uh, please let me know. I do know that some of the Mach 1 developers are watching my channel. So if I kind of misrepresented you, I'm sorry. Uh, just, just use the channel and clarify. Or my Discord community and clarify. And... Uh, if you have any questions or comments, as always, please use the comment section below or join my Discord community. In that link is in the description below. And with that being said, see you at the next video.